Welcome to A Place of Hope in Forney, Texas, where you will find hope-filled, obedient, passionate, and engaging people. Now on to today's message with Dr. Kevin Wentworth. Well, good evening to A Place of Hope. Our mission is to be mission-minded with the hope-filled, obedient, passionate, engaging followers of Christ and bringing hope to a hurting world. And that's kind of what we're in this day when we think of all the corruption and all the things happening. We've got, we've got the message and we've got the answer. They'll just listen to us. And so, uh, but we're glad that you're here. Glad to have all, some of our folks back, been traveling a little bit and glad it made it safe, but we're glad that you're all here tonight and we get a chance to, to welcome you to this hope-filled, obedient, passionate, engaging followers together with Jesus Christ. It's been a good day. I, I figured that some of you, and when you see this on the video throughout the week, you'll know that I've been at a cowboy church. I've got my boots. I've got my two-inch longer jeans that you're supposed to have when you wear boots. I got a belt that has my initials on it. I've got the Paisley shirt. The only thing I don't have yet is the hat. I'm working on that. So anyway, but I'm glad to be here. So you just got me from, we were at a cowboy church this morning, had a great time up there at Lone Star Cowboy at Grayson County, which is just outside of Sherman. And uh, we had a good time. And Pam and I got back a little bit later this afternoon. That could, if you could just move that just a little closer, that would even be better. <laughs> but today, I, 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 brought, I brought some of us that will show our age, I brought you back to some nostalgic moments today in the songs I picked, okay? And so I think you'll, I think you'll enjoy the songs, maybe. Some of them may just kind of shake you from what you're remembering from years ago these songs but we're excited even marty kind of got into it a little bit with them so we're excited about you being here and we're here to worship and the songs are going to go along with the series that i'm starting today the series of sermons i'm calling the series today the 828 series okay just it's all 828 series and it's going to be the whole summer would be my series at 828. So you can figure out later on, and the songs will help you figure out where we're going with this. But we're going to take a study in the life of Joseph. And uh, so I'm going through Genesis 37 through 50, but I called it my 828 series uh, because you think of all the ups and downs he had. And uh, so I'm, I'm excited about sharing it with you. I, you know, we went through that series in 1 John, and, and I know I'm doing a lot of talking, but I wanted to set you up because the 828 series excites me because it's going to show one of my favorite books that, uh, that I've enjoyed over the years is called God Works the Night Shift. It's from an author named Ron Meal, M-E-H-L. And it just talks about how God is always working when you don't think he's working. And so that's where this comes from, is this series of sermons will come from Joseph because there are a lot of things in his life he wondered where God might have been in all the different circumstances we find him in. So hang on there with me as you go along and you let people know we're on our series. But uh, this one says a lot. I go to the rock. Where do I go when there's no one else to turn to? Who do I talk to when no one wants to listen? Who do I lean on when there's no foundation stable? I go to the rock. I know that's able. I go to the rock. Anybody remember that song from years ago? This is a Dottie Rambo song, okay? Where do I go when there's no one else to turn to? Who do I talk to? I go to the rock, I know the table. I go to the rock. I go to the rock of my salvation. Go to the stone that the builder rejected. Run to the mountain and the mountain. 
mountain stands by me. The earth all around is a sinking sand. On Christ the solid rock I stand. When I need a shelter, when I need a friend, I go to the rock. Where do I hide till the storms have all passed over? I run to when the winds of sorrow threaten is there a refuge in the time of tribulation when my soul needs consolation I go to the rock I go to the rock of my salvation I go to the stone that the builder rejected run to the mountain and the mountain stand by me the earth all around is a sinking sand on christ the solid rock i stand when i need a shelter when i need a friend i go to the rock sing that chorus again i go to the rock of my salvation go to the stone that the builder rejected run to the mountain and the mountain stand by me the earth all around is a sinking sand on christ the solid rock i stand when i need a shelter when i need a friend i ago beautiful song and Dottie Rambo it's a lot of fun to sing I just like the way it starts where do I go when there's no one else to turn to you know I know it's kind of a peppy little song but who do I talk to when no one wants to listen who do I lean on when there's no foundation stable I go to the rock there's just one we go to the rock and so then we come across a songwriter that uh, one, kind of one of my favorites but it's been a while since I've sung this I, had, I just pulled this out I just you know I just said I thought about you guys tonight I said I'm going to go pull some of these oldies but goodies out I've had many tears and sorrows I've had questions for tomorrow there have been times I didn't know right from wrong my trials come to only make me strong
the mountain and I thank him for the valleys and I thank him for the storms he's brought me through I like this verse for if I never had a problem I would know that he could solve them I never know what faith in God would do. Isn't that a great song? Sing it now. Do it all. Do it all. I've learned to trust in Jesus. I've learned to trust in Our past, our thoughts through the, because it, it's kind of appropriate for today, isn't it? Well, here's another good one, and you'll have to stand for this one, but you'll know this one on the hymn from years and years and years ago. In the dark of the midnight, right? Till the storm passes over, till the thunder rounds no more. Isn't that 828 scripture? Fills right in here. In the dark. Of the midnight have I often my face while the storms howl above me and there's no hiding place in the crash of the thunder precious Lord hear my cry keep me safe till the storm Till the storm passes over, till the thunder sounds no more, till the clouds roll forever from the sky. Hold me fast, let me stand in the hollow of thy hand. There is no need to try, for there's no end of sorrow. There's no hope, there's no hope by and by. But I know thou art with me, hand to mine. 
the storm passes over till the thunder sounds no more till the clouds roll forever from the sky hold me fast let me stand in the hollow of thy hand keep me safe till the storm is gone. When the long night has ended and the storms come no more, let me stand in thy presence on that bright peaceful shore. seated I think this song says it well for what we've just it, it's kind of fun to bring those back up I mean I know I've thrown a lot of new ones at you but it's okay to bring those up because those are great songs well, all of us grew up on them most of us those of you that are going to listen throughout the week they may well I've never heard that song before well I got news for you. I was a teenager and a 20 year old when I was singing those songs and they all they did the same and I think Vernon, you'll agree, they bring the same kind of enthusiasm and rumble out of our voices because those are powerful songs. And when Andre Kraut sang that song, I think there were times I brought tears to my eyes. Just through it all, I've learned to trust in Jesus. I've learned to trust in God. And the one thing we know, here's one thing that kind of fills it all up in the 828 series. You are here, moving in our midst. So I want to worship you. You are 
way maker. You are way maker, miracle work, promise keeper, light in the darkness. My God, that is who you are. You are here, turning lives around. I worship you. I worship you. I worship you, yes I worship you, you are way maker, you are way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are, that is who you are, that is who you are, that is who you are. That is who you are. That is who you are. Sing those words again. That is who you are. 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 This is a great truth. Even when I don't see it, your work. Feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Father, thank you. Thank you for the truth of the songs about your being there in the midst of our storms and you're through it all and you are just everywhere to be seen in situations. Sometimes we don't see you, but we're grateful that we know. We know that is who you are. And even though we'd like to see you work differently sometimes, and even though we'd like you to work it a different way, than we thought would be best. I pray, God, that we would know that what we are here to accept is when we don't see the whole picture, that we trust you, that we look to you and just when we're lonely and we feel defeated and we feel like you're not around and you're not really doing anything, May we realize you are. I think that's probably the hardest part of a pastor's job and a DS job is to encourage pastors and to encourage people who are just so discouraged and without hope. We just wanna let them know this is who you are. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop working. 
I know, Father, what you run into is what we think you ought to be doing. You've had that problem ever since day one with your creation. We've wanted to do it our way. But we want you to know today, Father, that once again, as we begin this series at 828, that you'll help us to understand that all things work together for the good of them that love the Lord and are called according to his purpose. So I pray that you'll guide and direct all of our time together. Thank you for the wonderful folks that are here. Thank you for those that will listen later on. And hopefully this could be a message of encouragement and singing of encouragement, kind of bring some thoughts into their minds of what past of songs that meant something to them. But let them not look at the songs as being, oh, those are the good old songs. But may we look at those songs as songs that we need today in our day. That'll help encourage us, bless us, guide us as we listen to you tonight as you speak to us. For we ask it in thy name. And all God's people said, amen. I'll have to figure that one out. Working at the beginning. Look, all this technical stuff is fun when it works. But boy, it's sure frustrating when it doesn't. But uh, it is good to share with you tonight. I'm looking forward to it. Last week, we ended up having a great time at Pentecost service, and I appreciate all of our folks and those of you who attend there for going. Had a good service. So it, um, tonight's message is, the series is called 828, and the title of my message is When God Ruins Your Life. I like that for a, a title. Because I knew, you know, I like to find titles that are going to kind of give me that look. You know, they kind of, I look out there, and even Marty, when, he, when I read that, he was like this, and all of a sudden he looked up, what in the world? When God ruins your life. But it's going to be about the story of Joseph. And we're going to examine God's word in regards to Joseph. Uh, I won't tell you where I got this message from, uh, because I wouldn't want you to tell my son where I got it from, but he preached on Joseph not too long ago, and it just kind of stirred my heart a little bit. He didn't preach 14 chapters, but he did preach about Joseph, uh, and it, it spoke to my heart because, you know, you and I know about Joseph, and when we think of Joseph, what comes to mind? What are some of the things that come to mind? And I'll repeat them so that it gets on the video. What are some things about Joseph that comes to mind? Coat of many colors. What else? What's that? Thrown in the well, sold into slavery. Yeah. Put in charge of everything in Egypt. Yeah, and and just a whole bunch of things. We kind of know some of the story, but as I began to study through this, these 14 chapters, I wanted to examine God's word concerning the life of Joseph because I want to examine the scriptures in a different way than what we would normally do. And it's easy to study the life of Joseph and only note what Joseph did and some of the moralistic things that we learn from him, really. To think about him and all the situations he found himself in. But, and we know that If we look at chapter 37, which we'll be going through the whole chapter in just a moment, there's some interesting things that I think are important for us to learn. First of all, that parents should avoid playing favorites. (laughs) And that's what we see happening in 37. And it would cause hatred between siblings. Have you ever had a situation, and maybe maybe in your own home, I'm not going to say you did this, but... Is, is there some of your siblings that, or some of your children that might think you showed more favoritism towards one over the other? My boys, my boys always said I treated my, her, their sister much better than I treated them. You know, so there's always this competition. So you, got, you gave her this and you gave her that and you did this and you did that. And they never quit reminding me. And I told them, I said, if you keep it up, I'm going to give her more in the inheritance too. So just be quiet and be happy with what you have. But also, I think Joseph 
had to be careful, but he's only 17 years old. Don't brag about your dreams. He was bragging about his dreams that he had. But these are true. But the point that I want you to realize today is I go through this series at 828. What did God want us to learn? I don't think 37 through 50 is just a, a scattering of verses and chapters for us. But when we consider a strong reason why we should discard this kind of approach towards the life of Joseph and thinking about some of the things, there's nothing about the faith of Joseph to avoid the temptation to sexual immorality and, and faith not to kill his brothers. We know all those stories. He, he could have killed his brothers when they came from Egypt. But I want you to consider, what can we learn about God and what God is doing to his people? Okay, I wanna, I wanna take you that path. What is God doing? What, is, what are we going to learn about God in these scriptures? So as we study the life of Joseph, our focus is not going to be on Joseph, but it's going to be what can we learn about God through his life? And even though we can point out a lot of things that come to mind when we think about Joseph, I want to look at the God behind it, and that's kind of why I think about this. Think about it for just a minute as we get into this, why this is such an appropriate title that some of you were shocked at. Well, Joseph, right up front, could almost wonder, God ruined my life. That's a bad thing. So let's, let's start with the scriptures. Let's start with the scripture in, in uh, Genesis 37, and I want us to begin reading at verse number one, if we can, if I can find it in here. I know it'll be on the screen too, but I just want to make sure I keep. So Joseph settled again in the land of Canaan, where his father had lived as a foreigner. Now we're going to, it's going to be a long scripture night, okay? So this is the account of jo Jacob and his family. When Joseph was 17 years old, he often tended his father's flocks. He worked for his half-brothers, the sons of his father's wives, Beha, Beha, and Zephal. But Joseph reported to his father some of the bad things his brothers were doing. Okay. Who do we have Joseph here? Joseph, what, he, what, what, we, what we used to call someone who did this. Tattletale. He ran in and told bad things his brothers were doing. Jacob loved Joseph more than any of the other children. Now, Think about this. Already in this portion of scriptures, looks what's happening. He's reporting on his brothers, and Joseph thought of him more than the other children because Joseph had been born to him in his old age. Okay. So one day, Jacob had a special gift made for Joseph, a beautiful robe, but his brothers hated Joseph because their father loved him more than the rest of them. Now, come on. we got to understand something. The siblings know can sense who's loved, okay? And I think that's why we all be careful. They couldn't say a kind word to him, it says. One night, Joseph had a dream. And when he told his brothers about it, they hated him more than ever. Listen to this dream, he said. We were out in the field, tying up bundles of grain. Suddenly, my bundle stood up, and your bundles all gathered around and bowed low before mine. Oh, we're in big trouble right now, okay? His brothers responded, so you think you will be our king, do you? Do you actually think you will reign over us? And they hated him all the more because of his dreams and the way he talked about them. Soon Joseph had another dream, and again he told his brothers about it. Listen, I have had another dream, he said. The sun, moon, and 11 stars bowed low before me. He's really getting himself set up, isn't he? It's kind of interesting. I, have you, I don't know if any of you, if, if you ever had wondered, but this time he told the dream to his father, though, as well as to his brothers. But his father even now, okay, Joseph, enough is enough. What kind of dream is that, he asked. Will your mother and I and your brothers actually come and bow to you the ground before you? But while his brothers were jealous of Joseph, his father wondered what the dreams meant. 
So have you ever, have you ever studied this 37th chapter in any detail? Did, have you taken time like we did tonight to read that? There's quite an interesting ongoing situation going on, the dream. Now, um, how many of you have dreams? How many of you can remember them in the morning? <laughs> Sometimes, yeah, it's kind of shaky. Well, here's one that's very plain. But the interesting thing that I want to make sure we understand, Joseph is 17 years old. It is easy to forget how young he was. And the tension begins when his father gives him, gives the father of Jacob a bad report and the coat and the, all that going on. And he seems to be the one to give a message to Jacob. We don't know. It doesn't tell us what the brothers were doing. But we do know that the, if the, we do not even know if, the, if, if what he said was true, if the report was exaggerated. We don't know that. It just says he reported about some bad things about his brothers. Jacob loved Joseph more than the others and made him that robe. We read it. We're not exactly sure what the robe was. We know it was of many colors, very royal type robe. But the brothers had, you know, if you look at 37, and right here in the first 11 verse, you kind of know these brothers, I'm not going to just give them permission, but they kind of had a right to be upset. I mean, it, it, yeah. And then Joseph comes out of nowhere and talks about a dream and tells them what's going to happen. Shows them that they kind of understand the dream. We kind of read it here that, that he, Joseph is going to rule over them. And he had a dream similar to that. We saw that here. And so, I think it's very obvious, they weren't happy with him. They didn't like him. And I, I now I don't know about you, but when I think of a 17-year-old, I'm sure he just didn't tell them the story just once. Do you think he went around the house and said, guess what I know? Guess what you guys are going to do? You know, I, I'm thinking of a 17-year-old who's got this kind of a dream walking around. Ha, 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 I know something you don't know, and I know you're going to be. You know, think about that. I, I just think we have to get in, this, in the shoes of the story and understand it. So, but the thing that's interesting, I think it's lost. Who gave him that dream? Who gave him that dream? God did. See, in the Old Testament, in a lot of the times of our writings that we read from the scriptures, God gave dreams to get a message across. Now, I'm not sure, I think you will agree with me, I'm not quite sure Joseph knew the whole details except what we actually read, but there's an interesting thing that's going to take place, but it's farther down the road. But if God gave him this dream, God is the one giving Joseph those dreams. And these dreams are going to cause everything to unfold in Joseph's life that we're going to share in the next few weeks. Say what you want about Joseph. Say what you want. But these dreams were given by God, predicting the future of his family. Now, you can see how they interpreted it, right? And if you look at face value, we could see how that could be interpreted. But the thing that's not fair about these, this sermon series is we know the end of the story. <laughs> he didn't. He didn't know the end of the story. Even though he quoted this, and he, he, he didn't know how the sheaves and all the, the sun and the moon and the drought. You know, he did. We know it, but he didn't. And we have to always understand that dreams didn't come because they had too much coffee the night before. Okay? So there was no coffee the night before. They were, and I want, I want you to catch this. It's because I'm wanting this series to be about what God is doing. When I look at this, they were a means of God communicating to his people before the law of Moses was given. Dreams were not viewed as dreams, but messages from God. And I want us to hold that in our thoughts throughout the series. Because we don't see in our own lives, any one of us, I could point at any of us, 
We don't know what's going on in our lives when things are going on in our lives. So the message of God. But notice that no one wants to listen to this message given by God to Joseph. The family rejects it. They don't want to believe it. They think it's probably just 17-year-old wild dreams. But then let's go on to the next portion of Scripture and talk about the crisis. Soon after this, it's going to be a long Scripture, but I think the Scripture speaks to us to help us. Soon after this, Joseph's brothers went to pasture their father's flocks at Shechem. When they had been gone for some time, Jacob said to Joseph, your brothers are pasturing the sheep at Shechem. Shechem. Get ready and I will send you to them. I'm ready to go, Joseph replied. Go and see how your brothers and the flocks are getting along. <laughs> well, he's really setting them up. Jacob said, then come back and bring me a report. That dad's really getting him in trouble. So Jacob sent him on his way, and Joseph traveled to Shechem from their home in the valley of Hebron. When he arrived there, a man from the area noticed him wandering around the countryside. What are you looking for, he asked. I'm looking for my brothers, Joseph replied. Do you know where they are? Do you know, do you know where they are pasturing their sheep? Yes, the man told him. They have moved on from here, but I heard them say, let's go on to Dothan. So Joseph followed his brothers to Dothan and found them there. When Joseph's brothers saw him coming, they recognized him in the distance. And as he approached, they made plans to kill him. Here comes a dreamer. Here comes a dreamer. They said, come on, let's kill him and throw him into one of these cisterns. We can tell our father a wild animal has eaten him. Then we'll see what becomes of his dreams. Are you with me here? We're going to see what his dreams say then. If he's dead, how could he rule over us? But when Reuben heard of their scheme, he came to Joseph's rescue. Let's not kill him, he said. Why should we shed any blood? Let's just throw him into this empty cistern here in the wilderness. And I want you to emphasize empty. Just emphasize it. Then he'll die without our laying a hand on him. Reuben was secretly planning to rescue Joseph and return him to his father. So there's kind of a play going on. Okay, So when Joseph arrived, his brothers ripped off the beautiful robe he was wearing. Then they grabbed him and threw him into the cistern. Now the cistern was empty. Make sure I want you to catch that. There was no water in it, so he couldn't drown. Then just as they were sitting down to eat, oh, it's interesting. They throw him into a cistern, and now they don't have a problem eating with him screaming out, help. I can't imagine he's not screaming out of that well. They were sitting down to eat. They looked up and saw a caravan of camels in the distance coming toward them. It was a group of Islamites, traders, taking a load of gum, balm, and aromatic resin from Gilead down to Egypt. Judas said to his brothers, what will we gain by killing our brother? We'd have to cover up the crime. Instead of hurting him, let's sell him to those Ismaelites, traders. After all, he is our brother, our own flesh and blood, and his brothers agreed. So when the Ismaelites, who were Midianite traders, came by, Joseph's brothers pulled him out of the cistern and sold him to them for 20 pieces of silver, and the traders took him to Egypt. Sometime later, Reuben returned to get Joseph out of the cistern. When he discovered that Joseph was missing, he tore his clothes in grief, then he went back to his brothers and lamented, the boy is gone, what will we do now? Then the brothers killed a young goat and dipped Joseph's robe in the blood. They sent the beautiful robe to their father with this message. Look at what we found. Now, I want you to catch this next phrase. Doesn't this robe belong to your son? What's kind of strange about that statement? Does this robe belong to my brother? No, to my son. Their father recognized it immediately. Yes, he said, it's my son's robe. A wild animal must have eaten him. Joseph has clearly been torn to pieces. Then Jacob tore his clothes and dressed himself in burlap. He mourned deeply for his son for a long time. His family all tried to comfort him, but he refused to be comforted. I will go to my grave mourning for my son, he would say, and then he would weep. 
Meanwhile, the Midianite traders arrived in Egypt where they sold Joseph to Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, the king of Egypt. Potiphar was captain of the palace guard. Hmm. Now, I don't normally read a whole verse, a whole chapter, but I think we needed to set this story up. So here we see the brothers. We see what happened. We see the whole thing. You throw them into a cistern. It wasn't full of water, so he couldn't drown. But it's kind of interesting, all this plan that they put together and sold him. And then the way they went back to the father and said, is this not the coat of your son? Didn't say anything about our brother. Is this the coat of our brother? Is this the coat of your son? I think that was interesting. So this is what God's plan. The thing that's interesting about this the brothers are doing the same thing to Joseph. You're not going to rule over us. We're going to show you that we're going to stop what you thought was going to happen. The one who eventually ruled over them and saved them from the death of, the, of Joseph, these brothers hated. They hated the dreams that God had given. They hated the meaning of the dreams. In the same way, we hate the way God rules over us sometimes. Sometimes when God has something for us to do, we may not like what he has us to do. And when you think about Jesus, think about the hatred that went into putting him on a cross, the human condition, and how sin makes us blind to the purposes of God. And sometimes in our lives, we have, an we have, have often played this game what is God trying to do? What is he trying to show me? We've, heard, we've made those kinds of statements. But then there are times when we've watched people who have had things happen in their lives and they're angry with God. They are not happy with him. And sometimes you know some people and I know some people who have turned away from God thinking that God should have worked a certain way because they didn't see the whole picture. I want you to see why we're taking this time to go through this because this, to me, is powerful. So, but here's an interesting thing. Did you see anything in those scriptures that would let you know that God was still weaving his plan? Just in the scripture we read tonight. They didn't throw him into a well drowned. They didn't kill him. They sold him. What I'm trying to say is, could that be? We wouldn't see it. Now, again, we're on the other side of that, but I'm also saying to you, have you wondered some of the weaving in and out in your own lives? Rather, oh, is God, could that be? And the reason it's so important for us as we journey to, with God is to understand that I think I always tell people this. I'm going to allow you to have a human response, but I can't let you live there because God is doing something even in the midst of chaos, even in the midst of crisis. He is doing something that we don't always understand. Could it be the sale? Interesting. The sale to the Midianites, and then the sale to Potiphar. Huh. 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 You, you, you with me? This is, to me, this is pretty neat. All that, well, that's just coincidence. And let's look at it as a God thing, okay? So, so it's interesting. So we see Jacob's response. And we see the whole thing close out. So what's the application? So now I'm going to get to my sermon. What's the application? Here's an interesting application. Obedience does not guarantee success or ease of a moment. Have you and I been guilty of thinking, well, I'm a Christian, I'm a follower, I'm doing everything God wants me to do, and it doesn't seem that I'm guaranteed success or ease. I think of situations, and, and I'll, I'll, I'll use the, the family here about a son who's gone through some rough times, and 
He was a medical doctor and did things for people. And, you know, you could almost have that same kind of an attitude. Look what I'm doing. He did things overseas in Romania. And I, I'm only bringing that up because sometimes we can get into, and I just believe everything that he did, and a lot of some, some of you know people, they were obedient. They did exactly. They did exactly what God wanted them to do, and it wasn't easy. It didn't bring ease. It didn't bring a guarantee of success. And that bothers us, and I think it, it's okay to be bothered and wonder. But not only did Joseph suffer because he obeyed his father, but the text tells us that Joseph, because of the dreams God gave him, it is a reminder to us that God calls us to can cause our suffering. Just think. I got, I'm a perfect example of suffering. I had to live 19 years in Ohio. A Michigan Wolverine living in Buckeye country. That's suffering for Jesus. <laughs> I know you know that I'm being facetious here, but, but God is not in the business of making our lives easy while on earth. If we look at all the faithful followers and observe the truth, God often messes our lives up in order for his plans to be carried out. God ruins our lives. God often messes up our life plans to carry out his purpose and make us what we need to become. For whose glory? To make me look good. No. For him, for his glory. Can you agree with me tonight? This was not the life plan that Joseph had in mind. But here is a teenager looking for the future. Seems right now that his life is ruined by this message came coming from God. God's goal is not for us to have an easy, good life on earth. God's goal is to bring glory to himself and bring you and me to eternal life and to a purpose of why he's called us into the world he's called us to. And the second thing, what's the other application is this. We cannot see how God is accomplishing his purpose. We cannot see the final outcome of obedience. That's kind of tough to say because I'm human and I see these things happening in my life. And I, you know, I'm going to bring it to you to kind of, find, kind of bring this message for a landing. I told you many times I never wanted to be a district superintendent. But everywhere I've been, I was trying my best to be obedient to what God wanted me to do, even to go to Ohio State. But what's interesting, I could have never seen the final outcome of my obedience. And tonight I sit in a church in Forney, Texas, trying to get things going for the kingdom of God. And I am yet to see the final outcome. But it's his plan. It's his way. And he will honor obedience. God can overcome our circumstances. God uses what we are enduring to accomplish his plan. People plan against God and rebel in vain because God will be victorious. I can tell you this, I want you to hear this as a closing statement. You are not forgotten, you are not forsaken, and we just need to wait on the Lord and watch what he has in store. Amen? Now do you know why I call it the 828 series? We're going to see some interest. We're going to take a little rabbit trail next week. I'm still trying to figure that one out because... Chapter 38 completely goes off the rails, in my opinion, but we're going to study it. So if you want to get ahead, 
Read chapters 37 through 50, and you'll kind of find out where I'm going, okay? So, Marty, if you could take up our offering tonight, and again, those of you that will watch later on, if you'd love to send an offering, you can go to the Northeast Texas District uh, uh, website, go to Donation, A Place of Hope is the first one there. You can give through that, that uh, way or send it to us, and you can find our address at 15066 Rutledge, R-U-T-L-E-D-G-E Lane, Forney, Texas, 75126. Thank you for listening today. Join us every Monday night at 6.30 p.m. at 413 South Bodark Street in Forney, Texas. If you'd like to learn more, email us at kwentworth at netxnaz.net. That's k-w-e-n-t-w-o-r-t-h at n-e-t-x-n-a-z. .net.
Thank you for listening today. Join us every Monday night at 6.30 p.m. at 413 South Bodark Street in Forney, Texas. If you'd like to learn more, email us at kwentworth at netxnaz.net. That's k-w-e-n-t-w-o-r-t-h at n-e-t-x-n-a-z dot net.